Every time I sing the song, I think of my mother. I went into care when I was 14. I was a bit messed up, and it wasn't acknowledged what had happened to me in my mother's house. The reason I got into music was therapy. I just wanted to scream. Now, I always say anger is like a fist of tears, isn't it? It's made out of tears. It's just a big bowl of tears, not cried. Make no difference what you say. You're still alive. I came from a patriarchal country where I'm being told everything I can and can't do because I'm a girl. I'd figure, well, if I didn't take it from my daddy, I ain't taking it from anybody else. Fight the real enemy. But I don't know if it's so much a conscious problem that they have because I'm a woman. You know, I think it's because I, I'm, I'm not a conformist on any level. I really believe that Sinead's mental health struggles and unresolved childhood pain actually suffocated her true genius, which is that of an agent of change. Sinead O'Connor was never meant to be a pop star. It was really a protest singer, you know? But what most people miss is that her need to protest, which is very valid, stems from inner turmoil. And to be honest, I think there's more to her than a protest singer, because like most people in the spotlight, she is starved for love. And there's nothing wrong with admitting that. Because you don't end up in the spotlight and stay there for as long as she has by accident, because you don't want to. You want to, you need that love from the public. Like there is this one moment of her from a very old interview, right before Nothing Compares To You was released, and this guy was interviewing and asking her, do you expect it to hit number one? Will it be number one on Monday? I don't know. You like I mean, that though? Half of me sort of says, oh, well, you know, it's, it doesn't really make a difference, but then the other half is sort of going, oh, please, God, please. <laughs> She really cares, but she doesn't care. She kind of like smiled very cutely, which really tells you that she needed the love of the public. And again, there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. It doesn't take away from her genius and the issues that she was protesting for. Because indeed she did care about many causes, worthwhile causes, and she also had a very nuanced way of understanding them, which we're gonna get into in the video. But like her standing up for minorities, especially black people, and how she supported Public Enemy, that rap group. I protested the Grammys in 1989 because they refused to recognize rap music. I thought it was like admirable when she put the Public Enemy logo in her head. But again, underneath all that activism, there was this deep need for love. You know the way you go in a cafe sometimes and you feel a bit sad? The strange lady will ask you, are you all right? You want to cry? Do you know where she put a bit of milk in your tea and you nearly cry? All you need is a bit of tenderness. Yeah, that's why I think of her as someone who's emotionally very fragile. And that's what got in the way of her message and the things that she was fighting for. And on a lot of those issues, she was way ahead of her time, like how she exposed the church. Tearing up the picture of the Pope on TV 25, I mean, 30 years ago, was obviously something that ne didn't necessarily go down well with some people, but everything she was saying, every reason she did it, came true 10 years later with the dreadful, dreadful um, revelations of just exactly how crazy the church was. She was very fearless and fragile often at the same time. She did put herself into some very, very tough situations. And you kind of used to wonder and say, why is she doing this? So yeah, that emotional and mental fragility is what kind of got in the way. And the last, the nail in the coffin, if you will, the nail in the intergenerational trauma coffin was the death of her son, the very tragic death of her son, which happened about a year and a half ago. Yeah, that was one thing that she could not recover from. And it left a hole in her heart, which was already very devastated to begin with. Actually, my dear mentor, Eckhart Tolle, whom I adore, has a couple of words for Sinead on that. Any kind of loss or death leaves an emptiness behind when a form is no longer there. And you don't run away from that empty space. And indeed, it is very difficult to face this kind of emptiness, this kind of loss, this kind of pain. But the only way out of this kind of pain is through the pain itself. So surrendering to it, accepting it is key because this kind of loss, the basically the death of a loved one is inevitable. We're all gonna experience it at one point or another. The best way to think of it is like death is as a transformation. Again, it's easier said than done, of course, but it is a transformation, just like our transformation from our mother's womb to this life, going from this life to the afterlife, whatever it may be, that's just a transformation. It is the destiny of all humans to go through that transformation. Hey y'all, I'm in denial, you're a drag therapist. Welcome back to my channel. And if you're new here, what I do is I use the art form of drag, the playfulness of drag, the lightheartedness of drag to do some autotherapy on myself. And of course, if people benefit by watching, 
then even better. As I always say, I'm in denial so you can wake up. And this week we're talking about Sinead and how sad her passing has been and it's kind of like shook me to my core when I read the news not only because I loved her music but also because the theme of mental illness and the intergenerational family like trauma all these kind of struggles yeah those resonate with me and speaking of which by the way I've been a bit absent because I've been working on my new show called All About Me and My Mother which will premiere in September I'm in the middle of all the rehearsals and writing the script for a one hour show I can't wait to share it with you so links below if you live in the Netherlands or want to come to Netherlands in September and watch me but for now let's get back to Sinead as I'm sure you've heard by now a little over 18 months ago Sinead's son who was just 17 years old died quite tragically he basically chose to stop being alive he he escaped a mental hospital while he was on suicide watch and that's when it happened. So I can't even begin to imagine how earth shattering that must be. Now Sinead, who had already been a weed addict for 34 years at that point, switched to another drug, which she didn't mention, after the loss of her son. But Sinead's misery started long before her son passed away. Uh, my mother was a very violent woman, not a healthy woman. Um, she was physically and verbally and psychologically, spiritually and emotionally abusive. So when you're the victim of this kind of abuse, there's only one or two things that could happen. Either you become an abuser yourself, you inflict abuse on other people, or you inflict it on yourself. And that's what started Sinead's long history with substance abuse, but also just kind of like the self-destructive behavior and being her own worst enemy. Despite her genius, by the way, and her fierce intelligence and her beauty and the voice and all those things that are just amazing but she was her own worst enemy and i don't want to do like a psa against drugs because this is nothing against drugs themselves but the way some people use drugs like Sinead and uh it's kind of a form of abuse and she has a long history with prescribed drugs and recreational drugs the guy at the nut house said well from what i read about her in the papers i'd say she has bipolar disorder or the telephone yeah so that's how it, the diagnosis but well, half of me was like really quite wounded that it was made in such a dodgy way you know yeah. but i was just so grateful that somebody said right take that and you'll be fine yeah and that theme of misdiagnosis is very common in the mental health uh, field and then what happened was after a few years i began to, it began to dawn on me that in ireland and we were talking about this the other night in ireland there's this uh, terrible culture of and perhaps it's worldwide of you know we all seem to think doctors are god when to the dark day Now to go back a little bit to Sinead's childhood, basically the intense abuse that she suffered at the hands of her mom, needless to say, turned into a troublemaker. And then when she became a troublemaker, they were like, mm, she's unmanageable. So they put her in a home, which only compounded her issues because this home was supervised by women who were so bitter and isolated. And already they were isolated because of the abuse they suffered at the hands of men. So they were not in touch with their own pain, let alone have sympathy for the pain of someone else like Sinead or the other girls that were there. So it's like the blind leading the blind. So with this as her foundation, basically her family abusing her, then getting rid of her, what else can she do but struggle all her life? And with that as a base, you have no means to end the intergenerational trauma. And that's why she passed it on to her son. Not that she abused her son, but this kind of uh, environment of chaos and destruction I'm sure would have led to her son struggling because the boy was clearly struggling otherwise he wouldn't make a decision to stop living anymore now it's easier said than done of course but in an ideal world you would be able to accept after grieving of course and giving yourself the, the time and the space to really mourn someone but then to surrender to the loss and the pain of the loss and then gain a deeper understanding about who you are and life itself so we embrace the death that is here, when you surrender to what is, that's the greatest death. If only, girl, if only we can all be like Eckhart. And the amazing thing is a deep understanding happens, not in the way that the mind imagines it, a deep understanding of the universe happens as you enter the surrendered state. This man is unreal. Sometimes I think like, is he even human? What is happening? Because I find him to be very genuine. So genuine that he's almost like a, like an alien. How he's accepting of things. Even there are, there's so many times where he talks about the way people get angry and he like, oh, 
chuckles like as if it's this foreign concept to him it's it's truly incredible how at peace he is by the way a little bit of a tangent did you watch this documentary about Sinead it's called nothing compares it came out I think six months ago like at the beginning of the year and there's this one standout line from it there's nothing more deep and real than a baby and, and there's nothing more fake and unimportant than fame really what that line floored me. I was like, what the hell? And it was very confronting because it's so interesting. All my life, I've, I wanted to be a dad or I feel like there's something in being a parent that really calls me. But at the same time, fame and success and validation calls me with equal measure because the love of strangers, I mean, of course, it's very, it's very beautiful, but it's almost like the antithesis of bringing life into the world. So I'm going to break character for a second, the Eckhart character, because I to say something about this fame. You know, in the news now, this whole story broke about Lizzo and the allegations from her dancers, right? And it just shows you how everyone suddenly turned on her. Like literally a week ago, Lizzo was like this stunningly brave woman who stands for the rights of minorities and everybody's just in love with her. And now just complete 180, everyone. And it just shows you that this love that comes with fame, it's so fickle and so empty that it could just turn on a dime. This is not about how true or untrue the allegations are, but the whole thing is that don't put famous people on a pedestal to begin with. And also more importantly, all this like Hollywood fame game, it's just so fake. Because all these people are now are coming out against her and like, oh, we knew it all along. Like there's this director who worked with her supposedly like a while ago and she was like, mm, yeah, she was unkind. Yeah, I knew it all along. Yeah, really girl, really? Now you bring it up, fake, fake as hell. Hell. Anyway, back to the video and the theme of this video, which is basically the obstructed and suffocated and drowned genius of Sinead, her true genius, because it was like buried underneath all the mental health issues. And for me, her true genius is not only in her intelligence, but she had extremely nuanced opinions about religion and the way the music industry works. And when I say like nuanced opinions on religion, for example, like for someone who converted to Islam, and you know what they say, like people who convert to, to any religion, Islam or otherwise, become even more hardcore than the people who were born into it. But for someone who converted to Islam, and you see the image of her with the headscarf, she had very uh, sane, rational views on God. I don't like the word God. I think it's off-putting. It's, it's become an off-putting word. But I definitely think there is a, a, a presence. I don't think it cares if you call it Fred or Daisy. And also in that documentary about her life, she made a distinction, which I find also extremely nuanced to say, I did not hate the church. I hated what the Pope did. He was so involved in covering up what happened to everybody. I had a right to fight that evil because I loved the church. And also another point of view that she had that was extremely nuanced on the industry, how the industry suppressed rap in the 90s. The last time that I would have thought music changed society was with the birth of rap. Suddenly all the white kids were screaming, f*** the police. The music industry is in fact afraid of music and the power that music has to change the world. So the industry worked very hard to silence rap and to mimic it with artists that were saying nothing like Vanilla Ice, MC Hammer. And as for her being ahead of her time, it was even represented in her fashion. I think um, her image screamed more than feminism. This like non-binary, incredible, intersectional feminist. Her fashion sense was like 35 years ahead of the time. And also, I love this clip of her performing with drag queens and the stuff she used to say about drag queens and gay men. She used to say like, get, when she discovered the environment of queens and the ballroom scene, that these were all her daddies because obviously she had a fraught relationship with her father. But I loved that point of view. And this was again, like 30 years before it was popular to be like on the side of LGBT people. And something else that speaks to her genius and her, just a very special mind that she had that even in the depths of her mental illness and the mental health struggles, she still had very sharp observations about how the industry, like pharmaceuticals and how drugs are being pumped and given to patients. It's like she thought, OK, even though I'm struggling, but what is happening here is not OK. What happened was I was going to the stupid psychiatrist and I was saying to him, I feel I need some therapy. <laughs> Uh, because I felt, what I felt, I said was, I feel like there's a pool of tears sitting just right there. It's just ready to cry. Mm. 
He's like, uh, oh no, I forbid you to go for therapy. You're not to look at your childhood. You're to forget about your childhood. You're just to move on, forget about it. You know, take lithium, take this, take that. But again, because of the unresolved childhood PTSD and then fame came in to kind of like cover it up, her true message, her true genius, her activism, her, that spirit of protesting got just buried under everything. Like, for example, with, the, with her tearing up the picture of the Pope, which is actually a very powerful statement to make and a very important statement to make, also so ahead of its time. But it was motivated by her anger towards her mom because not only was the picture that she tore up found in her mother's bedroom. I took two things out of my mother's house. One was her cookery book and the next was a picture of the Pope, which had been on her bedroom wall. But also the tearing up the picture happened at the time when she started to discover more than just physical abuse that her mother did. Things I was discovering that my mother had done that I didn't know about. And then I had come across an article about families who had been trying to lodge complaints against the church. So the, the activism, which was in the right place, was colored by so much personal anger. So yeah, I think the issues were always clouded and confused in her brain. That's why I wish she got the proper healing and the proper grief counseling when her son died. Because it was clear that she was always searching for some spiritual rest, some spiritual grounding. And it shows how many times she actually kept going back to religion. Even though she associated with her mother and she was so angry about that, she also kept going back once she became a priestess and then she converted to Islam. So she was always searching. And I wish she had found someone like a more with a more Buddhist understanding of spirituality someone like Eckhart Tolle every form obscures God and the death of the form enables God which is the formless one life to shine through because by the way this is nothing against religion because I think religion is beautiful if it can provide you that peace. But if it's entangled with so much anger and personal issues like it was with Sinead, maybe find another route. Yeah, I know it's a tall order to expect her to do that, but when you don't get clarity on what's bothering you and you don't resolve the pain, you're always gonna have misplaced anger. Like when she directed all her anger at the Irish authorities after her son died. Now, of course, there were mistakes made by the hospital that let him go because he escaped from the hospital, but that's not why her son died. Not because the hospital made a mistake, but that's probably too painful to accept. And again, not to blame her, of course, because we're all part of this fucked up system. So it's more that, own your part, but that would have been too painful to take on. That's why actually a lot of people say that it's, it hasn't been announced yet how Sinead died, but a lot of people are speculating that the same thing happened as what her son did. I don't know if I, if I think that, I probably will just not think it until it's made public, but there were several moments throughout all her career that she would hint at the ideations that she would have. Like there's this one line that from her Ruby Wax interview that I'll never forget is that she said that the first thing she thinks of when she sees a tree is that it's something to hang herself from. And it was actually kind of funny, I laugh about it now, but you know when you're feeling kind of depressed, like I was, I was looking at trees and instead of a beautiful tree, I see something I could hang myself on, you know what I mean? But I think that despair comes from a deep loneliness and a feeling like you're always misunderstood. And I think Sinead in the end, she just got tired of trying to say things and nobody understanding her. Like there's this one interview of hers where she talks about social, the importance of social media, which I like because most people complain about social media, but for her, social media was kind of an, an antidote to loneliness because she could feel connected with other people, which tells you so much about her and what she longed for, right? There's a reason that God didn't just make one of us. You know, we're supposed to communicate with each other and be there for each other and help each other. And it's brilliant that, you, you know, you can talk to somebody in Guatemala when you're sitting in Limerick, do you know what I mean? It's a, a salve, not a cure, but a salve for loneliness. And this kind of intuition, this kind of understanding and knowing inherently that what you need is connection, that comes from a deep sensitivity. And that can happen through intense suffering or through the power of a spiritual teaching. But at the end of the day, we will never know, or maybe we will at some point if the family decides to announce, but we don't know how she actually died or if she did what her son did. So for now, I will just assume that she died of a broken heart because that actually can happen. There's this thing called broken heart syndrome, which is also called stress-induced cardiomyopathy. And that can be caused by emotionally stressful events like a loss of a loved one. And it can even be misdiagnosed as a heart attack because the symptoms and test results are similar. 
So what happens in a broken heart syndrome is that part of the heart temporarily enlarges and doesn't pump well. And that can lead to severe heart muscle failure. And most people recover, but of course Sinead is not most people, because in some rare cases it can be fatal. So maybe she did die of a broken heart. Anyway, at the end of the day, all we can say is just rest in peace, Sinead. And I hope you can take this opportunity to check out that documentary about her because it's beautiful. And of course, dive into her catalog of music because especially her first album, The Lion and the Cobra, which by the way, had two different covers. The original cover was of her screaming, but when they decided to release it in the States, they went for this other cover where she was looking a little bit more feminine. It was already like the beginning of the industry kind of trying to make her something what she wasn't but that album is beautiful and of course nothing compares to you is beautiful but her first album has so many wow a lot of gems so check it out and i'd like to leave you with a couple of words from Eckhart Tolle which are very good to remember next time you feel stuck in your mental health struggles because it's very tempting for our mind to trick us into thinking that we're just this lost person because when we're struggling mentally and emotionally we can just think that that's all we are this is where I think it's good to remember these words from Eckhart. This mind-made sense of self is also much more focused on the negative than the positive. To be free, you awaken to who you are beyond your history and your life situation. 